people are constructing very complex price indices, aren't they, with, you know, all a basket of goods that we buy weighted according to how much we spend on each one and then watching how that changes. But I thought, of course, things change over time, like what goes in the index and it's weighting. You know, I think there was one example of um, the Bank of England said, like, gentlemen's cardigans, apparently. <laughs> this is what the Bank of England on the website said, were once included in that. <laughs> now they're not in fashion. They have to be replaced. Problem is they're so slow getting going, cardigans might be back in fashion by the time they put that out. Would you agree if you're a politician... For any given level of price rises, you might be inclined to choose an index construction which tends to underplay inflation. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, MMT scholar and author Phil Armstrong. And we're going to be talking to Phil in a moment about inflation, hyperinflation, the gold standard, John Maynard Keynes's bank or plan, and more. But first, a bit of context for anyone new or newish to MMT. The framework for understanding modern money is that monetarily sovereign governments such as the US, the UK, Japan, Canada, or Australia issue new currency into existence every time they spend rather than spending what they've collected from taxing or borrowing. I know that's a hard thing to swallow if this is your first time hearing it, but for a government that creates its own currency, the primary purpose of issuing tax bills is to get people to need the government's currency so they can then spend that currency into existence and hire people now looking to do things to get that currency. So the tax bill comes first, people needing to pay the tax and therefore looking for things to do to get currency, otherwise known as unemployment, comes second. The government hiring people to provision itself comes third. And taxes being paid, i.e. currency being returned back to the government, comes fourth. And you can listen to our first three episodes if you want more detail on that. It's jarring the first time you hear money explained like this, but it's not as controversial as it sounds. Explanations similar to this in economic literature go all the way back to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Given that this is how modern money systems work, it follows that governments that issue their own currency are not revenue or borrowing constrained when it comes to spending. And this leads to concerns about inflation. The concern is that if too much money is spent chasing too few goods and services, the price of those goods and services will get bid up, And a bidding war between the private sector and the government with its infinite checkbook will exacerbate this trend. And this pushes the buying power of the currency down, i.e. you need increasingly more money to buy the same basket of goods year on year. And this is what people understand as inflation. And that's what this episode's about. So just a few things before we dive in regarding that basket of goods. In the interview, Phil mentions CPI and RPI. And they are the Consumer Price Index and the Retail Price Index, which both measure how the overall price level, that's how much all prices have risen or fallen over time, by looking at prices for a given basket of goods. The CPI and RPI have different goods in their baskets. And as you'll hear, the decision about what gets left out and what stays in the basket, more likely than not, has an agenda-serving component to it. Next there are at least two types of inflation. The scenario I described earlier, the too much spending chasing too few goods situation, is known as demand pull inflation. And that's not to be confused with cost push inflation, which is where the price of an important good or service that can't be substituted, such as oil, is raised substantially. And that's what many experienced in the 1970s, when between 1973 and 1974, the OPEC nations restricted their supply of oil to certain nations, including the UK and the US. 
and then later in 1979 when global oil production diminished in the wake of the Iranian Revolution. There's more about this in our episode 7 with Dr. Stephen Hale, which is a really good episode in my completely objective opinion. The US policy response to this second oil shock in 1979, led by Paul Volcker, then chair of the Federal Reserve, was to raise interest rates to an unprecedented level, peaking at 21% in 1981. The idea being that if interest rates go up, it's expensive to borrow, to invest, and this slows down economic activity and brings about disinflation. Of course, the side effect of this was a huge recession and misery for millions, but of course, those millions are not the ones deciding policy. If you listen to our episode 59 with MMT founder Warren Mosler, you'll hear that the MMT view of interest rates is the other way around. Because the government is a net payer of interest to the economy, Raising interest rates increases the number of dollars potentially chasing goods and services and likely adds to inflationary pressures. As Warren has said elsewhere, his view is that Volcker's interest rate hikes likely prolonged the inflation and the deregulation of natural gas by President Jimmy Carter was, in his opinion, the thing that broke the inflation. Also in this episode, we mentioned the Nairu, not to be confused with Nauru, the small Micronesian island which is known for its large deposits of guano, or, pardon my French, bat excrement, but that's where the similarity ends. The Nauru is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, sometimes called the natural rate of unemployment, to make it sound a bit more touchy-feely and in line with God's ineffable plan, whereas in reality it's in line with Milton Friedman's highly effable plan, based on an idea that there's a rate of unemployment below which inflation will accelerate. So we need to keep the number of unemployed people above this magic number, which is estimated to be around 5 to 6% in the US, for instance, which again is millions of people all suffering a precarious existence and early death because of, as Keynes described it, quote, the conservative belief that there is some law of nature which prevents men from being employed, that it is rash to employ men, and that it is financially sound to maintain a tenth of the population in idleness for an indefinite period, the sort of thing which no man could believe who had not had his head fuddled with nonsense for years and years, unquote. I think he would have been really good on Twitter, actually. Anyway, the MMT prescription for fighting inflation, the job guarantee or transition job, delivers true full employment. And we go into detail on how it also works to stabilise prices in our episode 4 with Dr. Fidel Kaboob and episode 47 with Professor Pavlina Chernova. I hope you get time to listen to those, but the important thing to focus on is that this prescription has to be better on a point of logic than the way we control inflation now, again, by keeping millions of people involuntarily unemployed to be in accordance with people who have had their heads fuddled with economic guano for years and years. By the way, I'm also developing my plan for price stability. My proposal is that all policymakers, intellectuals and pundits who believe in a natural rate of unemployment should be the ones to be kept out of the workforce against their will to fight inflation. And whatever that number of people is, is called the Manairu, the moral non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. And doing this would have two benefits. It gives the people who believe we should control inflation this way a chance to live their values. And secondly, I predict it will give rise to a huge increase in academic papers arguing the scientific case for raising unemployment benefits to a level that human beings can actually live on and maybe go skiing occasionally. A couple more notes. You'll hear Phil mentioned the discount window, which is where member banks, commercial banks, go to borrow reserves directly from the central bank to cover any shortfall they may have. As I understand it, the central bank would rather commercial banks lend to each other rather than borrow from the central bank. So the interest rate on borrowing at the discount window is higher than the interbank lending rate. Important to know, when you borrow from a commercial bank, they are not lending you their reserves. As a bank customer, you only affect the reserve system indirectly. Your bank's reserve account is their bank account at the central bank, and it's the account they use to settle up with other banks. If you want to know more on how that works and why it's important, listen to our episodes 13, 30, 31 and 43 in that order. 
I think that's everything covered. There are more useful links in the show notes and there's a link to where you can support this show financially by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 76 British pence at the time of recording. It really helps keep the show going. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all our shows and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. And I know I say this every week, but I mean it every week. Thanks to everybody who supports us, whether it's financially or by listening and recommending us to other people. And thanks for the time you put in to unfuddling the guano. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. I'm here with your friend and mine, Patricia Pino. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm good as ever. And also as ever, delighted to welcome back to the MMT podcast, MMT scholar, author, soon to be Dr. Phil Armstrong. Phil, it's great to have you with us. Great to be here again. I enjoyed the last two so much. I've got to come back. Great stuff. And because it's been such a good year for MMT books, we already had the macroeconomics textbook doing great. Stephanie Kelton's deficit myth, Pavlina Chernova's case for a job guarantee. And in a few months time, your book, which we'll talk about in a bit. But because it's been such a good year, We've got people who now have broken through that primary stuff about government spending. They get that government issues new currency when it spends. And now they're on to the next stage of questioning, which I would characterize as, okay, I get it. Monetarily sovereign governments create new currency when they spend. They're the monopoly issuers of their dollars, pounds, yen, whatever. Their spending is not limited by the amount of revenue they can collect via taxes, nor do they have to borrow already issued currency in order to spend. So these governments are not revenue or borrowing constrained, but surely a government can still overspend. And as Stephanie Kelton puts it in the deficit myth, when it comes to monetarily sovereign governments, evidence of overspending is not what happens to the government deficit, it's what happens to inflation. So would you agree with that? And could you define inflation, Phil? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, it's a case of, um, there's an MMT uh, phrase, isn't it? All spending carries an inflation risk. So basically, if you imagine a world without a government in an abstract sense, you know, it is possible in a, in a totally private world, if, if individuals are spending loads and loads and loads of money and there wasn't enough output to match that demand, there would be inflation. So carrying on to the government, yeah, if, if the government's net spending, when you add that to the spending of foreigners on our stuff <laughs> and private spending, if you, if you chuck the government spending on, on top of that, net spending, of, so spending minus tax, if you like, if that's too high, shall I say, and you, you, all your output is available, you can't make any more, you will generate inflationary pressure. The difficulty lies, of course, that... Um, Inflation can come from other sources. For example, it may be cost-push inflation. So in other words, inflation coming from above on the market. You know, so you might have something like, you know, say, a raw materials, expensive, wage rates go up. Firms might raise their markup. Prices will then rise from below. So if you like, prices can rise because of too much spending by the state or by other agents, or it could be increasing costs, or it could be a mixture. So basically, my view of inflation, it's a complex phenomenon. It can have multiple causes. You can't just say it's always caused by the government creating too much money, like monetarism. You know, it might be excess state spending, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And in the definition of inflation, I mean, it's quite common that people think a change in some index is inflation. So if, like, you know, the price index goes up, that's inflation. But to me, inflation is something more than a simple price rise. It has to be general and it has to be sustained. Now, you could say, well, what does general mean and what does sustained mean? And, we, you know, you could spend a long time trying to work out what that is. But there has to be some element where, you know, there's a price rise, for example, and then this somehow generates something in the system that perpetuates itself. Where price, prices keep on rising. You know, maybe wages then rise and prices then rise. So you've got some sort of spiraling effect. So prices keep on rising. So the idea of like you had a one-off jump in prices 
and then they just stay where they are. That's not inflation. It's like a price rise, a general price rise. So this is the thing about how I would see it. So in summary, inflation can have multiple causes, excess net state spending being one of them, but the only one. And inflation needs something more than some mere jump in some arbitrary price index. It needs to be sustained general over a time period. And then economists and statisticians, more likely the latter, can debate what they think that is. If that answers the question. So th- does that make it very difficult to measure then, like to, to isolate where, the you know, if you have... Like there's a lot of noise, it seems, in in the measurement of, of of sustained price rises. If if you know various things can be happening at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a statistician, but my short mm. answer to that is yes, because the construction I couldn't do it. Respect to the guys that do. I mean, people are constructing very complex price indices, aren't they? With you know all a basket of goods that we buy weighted according to how much we spend on each one and then watching how that changes. But I thought, of course, things change over time, like what goes in the index and it's weighting. You know, I think there was one example of um, the Bank of England said, like, gentlemen's cardigans. Apparently, <laughs> This is what the Bank of England on the website said. Well, once included in that, <laughs> now they're not in fashion. They have to be replaced. Problem is they're so slow getting going, cardigans might be back in fashion by the time they put that out. You know, so, yeah, it's an art. I mean, deciding what goes in the index, except it's very, very different. And then there's different forms of indices as well. I mean, would you agree if you're a politician for any given level of price rises, you might be inclined to choose an index construction which tends to underplay inflation, particularly when you're in an inflation environment, than overplay. So you might say, well, let's use the CPI. It's a long time ago. But as I remember, any given rises of the cost of living, the CPI tended to measure lower than the RPI. It's not so good if your pension's based on the CPI, not the RPI. But it does make a lot of the government's been very effective, isn't it? Or the central bank. When in fact, all you do is change the index. So it's an art form, and it is difficult. And obviously, you've got this idea, well, in general, well, if there's, if there's an increase in prices... Is it to do with too much demand or is it to do with increasing costs, maybe do with import costs or shortage of raw materials, or is it a mixture of the two? Tricky question. But I think in a way what I would say is that in a country like Britain, they just assume that change in the interest rate is going to affect inflation. Now, I think I probably talked about this little model before with the little kid with the plastic car. Now, the assumption is that if you change the interest rate, let's say they're right, all right, that changing the interest rate does affect demand and does determine the price level in terms of demand. What if inflation has nothing to do with demand? What if it's cost? So even if they're right on that, they've still got it wrong. Now, when you, when you bring in the fact that the interest rate doesn't even work in the direction they're working, so what I'm saying is, one, most inflation is probably cost push. And two, if you raise the interest rate, it's expansionary. You can see why, not being rude, most central banks' track record inflation control is like rubbish. And that's generous. I mean, very rubbish if there is. So it's a difficult question to unravel. My feeling is most inflation we've had in recent times has been cost generated. Mm, Yeah. Because going into politics, you know, in the neoliberal period, it's a deliberate political ploy, isn't it, to run the economy below capacity because it's a good way of disciplining the workforce. And if you can make something up like a Nehru or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which is like fairies in the garden, you could say, we want unemployment <laughs> more than, I pick a figure like they do, bit of paper, 5%, 7%. If it gets... You know, any lower than that, you know, we get inflation. What that really means, any lower than that, the workers will be emboldened <laughs> and then they'll go and drive wages up and then the profit share will drop. Whoops. Handy that, isn't it? When you think about that narrow, it's, it's really useful, isn't it, for, for the old capitalist class? I just leave that out there for the <laughs> listeners to come look, you know? Quite convenient. <laughs> I love the way you keep the politics out of it. You know, everybody just... Yeah, yeah, but it's neutral. <laughs> everybody could just make up their own mind about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the thing, like, to, to me, it's quite confusing because, 
you know, they have this one fix for inflation, like one size fits all fix for inflation at the moment, which is just the interest rates. Is this because they don't understand the different types of inflation or, you know, it, it seems like an approach where they say, oh, well, the market knows when to generate inflation and when to tell us when to act and we'll just let it do what it does and naturally adjust itself. You know, or, or is this just kind of them saying, we have no idea what we're doing. Just yeah, adjust interest rates, you know, that, that, that should fix it. it. Is it one of those things where it's like, you know, when you've got a hammer, every problem looks like a nail and they've got monetary policy. <laughs> That's it. That's what we're doing. That's what Tony Lawson always says, that the only two mainstream economists have got is a hammer. And it's very handy for knocking in a nail. But when you try to clean windows. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I mean, my feeling is the underlying, I'm not saying they know this, I mean, this is, you know, like it's a, it's like a, an inbuilt supposition. They think that markets generally work. So if mm -hmm. that's either superficial or embedded in, so in other words, they've got in, a, in their heads this idea of some sort of classical dichotomy, you know, that more money means the price level goes up in the long term. Now, you, your listeners can decide what the long term is because nobody says what mm -hmm. that is. So... The markets are generally working and markets determine relative prices. So if you chuck some money into the system, then at some point that will translate pretty much one-to-one, -one, the old quantity theory, into an increased price level. Now, therefore, logically speaking, you would say, well, shouldn't they just control the amount of money going into the system then? Because then you could control inflation result the problem is that's politically impossible it's a utopian deal because if you well whether you could control the quantity of money is another question but let's say you could you would then have to let the interest rates swing in completely wild directions you might have to jam up the banking system you know you don't want to do that so essentially what they end up with i mean going back to the thatcher regime is well, okay, we're going to leave markets alone. We're just going to use the interest rate, and the interest rate will affect bank lending. Got the, as I said, the direction wrong, which will then intermediate have an intermediate effect on the money supply, which will affect inflation. So it's a sort of roundabout route. Now, when I did my master's some years ago, one of my master's tutors, he was really pleased with himself because what he got was he got some questionnaires that the British government, before they did the medium-term financial strategy, had sent out to frame its economists. And the one he was really proud of is when they had something that was sent to Milton Friedman. Now, as you might imagine, Milton Friedman was all over very, very keen on the idea that the government was going to target the money supply. Uh, it's going to roll back the frontiers of the state and reduce, you know, the idea of, you know, nanny state interfering with markets. You liked all that. And when we say control the money supply, we're talking about exogenous money, i.e. we're going to say this is how many pounds you're allowed to have. He liked that idea. But the crucial thing is he was very, very scathing about the method that we're using, interest rates. He said you need to... It's, his example, I think, was it's like... Um, trying to control the output of cars by controlling the income of people that drive cars and buy them, rather than the raw material, steel. Now, I don't... Somebody I was talking to, I can't remember it was, was telling me recently, actually, that Friedman disliked Thatcher. I can't remember who it was. And wow. I think part of the reason was she wasn't doing monetarism properly. Because you've got to control the quantity of money directly. You can't just control the interest rates. Because in the theory, it's meant to be exogenous. So why do you need to control the price of it? Because So the whole thing was, if you like, breaking with his theory. It doesn't work. There's no monetary rules. So he thought it was a stupid way of doing it. So in other words, the idea was good. Control the quantity of money and that will control inflation. Yeah, restrict, reduce the growth rate of growth of money supply, all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. But using interest rates to do it doesn't make sense to him. 
But they couldn't do that because it's a utopian project. You know, they're not going to let the interest rate go wherever it needs to go, you know, and it may even result in the system crashing. Uh, and as Volcker, you know, his old Volcker experiment, you know, that I think you mentioned previously to me was, you know, this idea that Volcker tried to control the quantity of reserves in the system. Well, all that happened is they just went to the discount window. <laughs> You don't let banks access reserves, then the system crashes, you, the payments won't clear. So essentially, the central bank has to passively provide reserves to the system. Or, you know, so monetarism is just a utopian project, you know, in my opinion, anyway. So nowadays, the, to go back to the original question, nowadays they've retained the initial assumption, if you like that you leave markets alone so you don't be fiddling on with price controls, incomes, policies, all these things. What you've really got to do is control the rate of growth of spending. They've kind of ditched the money supply as an intermediate target. So remember, they had interest rates, which affect the money supply, which affect inflation. They just ditched the one, and now they just go interest rates to inflation. And in a way, that's why we are where we are, in my opinion. I think it's more of an accident than anything else. So let's just take a step back and unpack a bit of that now. So let's say inflation is a continuous rise in the overall price level. Yeah. So that means over time, all goods and services are getting more expensive. Yeah. Put into one side for a moment that policymakers, economists generally agree that some inflation is actually desirable. Yeah. Governments actually have an inflation target yeah. to sustain it at about 2%, you know, generally. Yeah. Um, but can we just tackle there's a common misconception which is the idea that if you create more currency you make it less valuable just by creating more of it you know that's a it's a very simplistic view but it, it's got an intuitive sense to it that yeah. and and that that's where inflation's always come from you yeah, know yeah. governments just keep making more of their tokens and those tokens decline in value just because there's more of them now they're less rare now and ar- around this time is when zimbabwe comes in and yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. i think that's a much more easy one to knock down really the problem with it is is what people are confusing is in my opinion anyway the amount of spending there is with the amount of stuff that you use to spend. All right? I realize it's only a bit of a... Well, for example, if the government created a billion quid or a trillion quid or 10 trillion quid, gave it to me and I put it in a box, what will that do to the price level? Nothing. Would you agree? I'm just an idiot. I've just got a trillion quid in the box. Now, I'll argue with the guy on Twitter, and he's all oh, the very existence of the money. <laughs> Everybody these, just these knows. These guys live in a sort they can, of they can smell it. crazy world where <laughs> if I produce some more money, like there's some sort of like, <laughs> force, you know, in, in uh, Star Wars, the force knows that money's in that trunk. All right. <laughs> and the price level magically goes up. The very existence of money under a, you know, in a trunk or under a mattress. Somewhere. Well, that is really going to be inflation. Now, come on, you know. So obviously, if I, if I was fortunate enough to be given a trillion quid and I started spending it, Come on. Yeah, we haven't discussed the fee for this yet, have we? No, no. <laughs> is, this, is this your negotiation? <laughs> I, I've just started, because uh, I'm a kid, you know, and I, I found some old football cars from the 1960s, you know, like old footballers, you know, like Gordon Banks as a young goalkeeper, etc. So I started buying these on eBay. Now, if I've got a trillion quid, I'm going to be bidding big for these. I'll just put in a big... Now, the thing is, realistically, though, moving outside my hobbies, if I can't bid in a ton of cash for rare things, or even not rare things, that will drive up the price level. Now, initially, would you agree, if you've got a lot of spare capacity... The prices are given, aren't they, on eBay and that. A lot of them are buy it now. Or if you go on Amazon, it just says how much it is, doesn't it? So initially spending, you know, if I got maybe not a trillion, maybe just a couple of billion, I might just go buying things at the prices that they're at. So make it work a bit harder, you know, making a bit more. But if I kept on doing it, would agree we would hit some sort of capacity problem. You know, the producers might have to get people in, to do overtime, wages would go up, 
And then people might be thinking, hang on a minute, this is a crazy guy there who's bidding a load of money for something. So the prices outside me would go up because people want to buy stuff from each other in order to sell it to me, the guy with a trillion quid or billions of quid. So once you get the capacity constraints, yeah, but it's the spending, the spending that is crucial, not the stock of money itself. Now, I have been reading a little bit about the Weimar Republic inflation, which is quite interesting. It's very complicated. But the general narrative is, you know, there's a guy at the Weimar, uh, the Reichsbank, you know, and he just one day thought, well, oh, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to print a ton of cash. Let's <laughs> <laughs> bring over your wheelbarrow. And then we got hyperinflation. Now, would you agree, you know, even in those days, you know, it's not that long ago, some of his mates, I'm not sure that's such a wise move. Well, why not? I'm going to be dead popular doing the new policy. <laughs> why do you do it? Now, you've got, obviously, you've got lots of literature in that, but essentially, the, the value of the mark before, and this is in chronologically before the rise in prices, fell, all right? So the value of the mark went down. The price level in Germany started to rise. All right, so the price level is going up. Now, would you agree if the price level is going up, you need to print banknotes with a high enough value mm -hmm. for the community to buy the things at the prices they're quoted? You know, if a pint of beer was a thousand quid, all right, it's no good having banknotes. With fivers on. So what was that? Wages initially, at least in Germany, were keeping pace at the price level, more or less. So the Reichsbank was printing sufficient money to allow the system to operate. Now, what you could say is that that was irresponsible. What, what the Reichsbank should have said was, right, we're not going to keep printing these Ripley's value banknotes and the system will crash. So in other words, you can't pay that your workers the wages you've agreed because we're not going to give you the money. So the economy would ground to an unceremonious halt, would you agree? Because, you know, I don't know, beer costs, I don't know what, our billion marks, so you're only going to give you five. So the economy would stop. Now, you could make that argument, but that's not the argument that's made. So what I'm saying is the price level went up first. Then the rights bank produced loads of banknotes to allow people to operate that banklet at that price level. Now, I'm not saying that was the right thing to do. You know, Schacht comes in, you know, Schacht, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he, everything of the rent market is a complex issue. But the idea of saying that the cause of hyperinflation was the printing of excess banknotes is just plain wrong. All right. Because the chronology doesn't fit it. You know, and if you read the work by the, the guys that were in Germany at the time, writing at the time, none of them thought that because could see it. I mean, it's a famous thing that Havenstein kept on apologising to people for not being able to print enough banknotes quick enough so that they could all buy what they wanted in the current lifestyle. You see what I mean? So he was aware of the problem, but... So they had to have all these new printing places trying to produce the banknotes. So I was like, you may say that he shouldn't have done it. You know, he should have ground the economy, you know, a bit of austerity, don't do it, crash the system. But that's a different point, if you see what I mean. And so everybody caught Weimar and all these sorts of things, but the narrative just doesn't fit. And, and I did read a book from a guy, uh, Hefflerich, who was around at the time, you know, he worked in the, the Reichsbank, he just laughs at you know, what he calls the Anglo-American idea that the money printing preceded the price level rise. I mean, why would anybody do that? If your price level is at a certain level, why would you suddenly go into the right span and say, right, lads, warm up the printers? Wouldn't do it, wouldn't it? Crazy. You've got to be careful with this thing. So I just, it's a long-winded story, but it, it, I like exactitude on these things. Let's, let's get it right. You might blame the government. But it's not really to blame in exactly the way they say it should be. That's what I'm saying. Did you want to back up and just say what led to the rise in the price level with Weimar? Because, you know, you're saying that the, the printing started after the, the sharp rise in, in, in the price level. I would argue there are two basic reasons. Firstly, 
Uh, well, obviously, that the invasion of the Ruhr, for example, all right, which had a really bad effect on confidence in the German economy, huge amounts of speculation against the mark. That drives down the value of the mark astronomically. Okay, now this took over a long period of ups and downs. It's a complex process. Like I said at the beginning, it ain't easy. But in simple terms, first thing is a catastrophic fall in the value of the mark. So what you've got then is very, very, very high prices of imports, of crucial imports. When you say it was a huge fall in the value of the mark, what are we measuring that against? Everything else? Against the dollar and the pound. But predominantly the dollar, which was the major currency, and the pound, the other major currency. So if the Germans were buying anything from America or from Britain, bear in mind it's a post-World War when the German economy was in a very poor condition anyway. Vital things they had to buy. They needed to access foreign currency to do that. So anything coming in with a drastically reduced exchange rate would cost huge amounts of marks, the so-called paper mark as opposed to gold mark. So the Germans would be like handing over massive amounts of marks to buy imported goods, which are now incredibly expensive. Now, once that process starts, it's then exacerbated by the fact that, you know, the, the French and Belgians invade the Ruhr, uh, and there's like passive resistance in the Ruhr. So what happens is the German government keep on paying the workers, but uh, they're not producing anything. So if you imagine massive amount of government spending, but very little spend it on, and then what happened as well is once the price level started to rise, the tax system couldn't keep up with it. So Warren uses the phrase ultra-high deficits. So, I mean, I don't know the figures, but you're getting a point where, like, a very tiny proportion of the money spent by the government is actually getting collected back in taxes because once the inflation gathers pace, your tax authorities can't collect the stuff. So you've got the two key factors which are acting very much together in generating German hyperinflation. I would argue, one, the catastrophic fall in the value of the mark. I mean, like, quadrillion or whatever. I mean, huge fall in the market, combined with what Warren calls ultra-high deficits, where the government spending a lot of money paying the workers in the Ruhr, it needs to buy stuff on markets when, obviously, it's very expensive owing to the fall of the mark. Now, once that process starts, it's gathering pace, as you can imagine. No one's hanging on to any money because they want to spend it quick because tomorrow it's not worth anything. Taxes aren't keeping, the deficits are getting bigger and bigger. At that point, the price level's out of control, okay? So you can either crash the system or you can print enough banknotes to allow the system, you know what I mean? To, to It's almost like being on drugs. Are you going to go cold turkey or are you going to keep doing it? And obviously the, the Reichsbank did do that. You know, there are great authors who, you know, spent, a lifetime writing about these things, you know, looking at the whole process. But essentially, that's what I would say was the main cause of it. So I would say that the printing of banknotes was an effect of a higher price level, not a cause, if you see what I mean. It's a little bit like Warren talks about the source of the price level being the government ratifying the price level rise by continuing to pay, pay market prices? If, if the government refused to issue the money to allow spending at the current price level, then it couldn't have continued. But the problem with that is, as Warren and Randy have said in their work, it does grind the system to a halt, you know? Got it, and yeah. You, like, it, it's a painful process. And when um, Schlacht did put the brakes on, you know, with his renting mark thing that everyone knows about, it, it was a painful process. A lot of people did not like what he was doing because, and it, and it wiped a lot of wealth out for a lot of people. You know, the unemployment went up. So getting out was painful. And I accept all of these things, you know, and it's a hugely complex. Because obviously with the reparations, the Germans didn't want to pay them. They didn't feel they ought to pay them. You've got all the politics in, you've got all the speculation. You've got the idea, well, did the Germans really want to? prevent the mark falling, and all of these other questions, which is too big for an interview. 
But in terms of simple, the simple essence, what all I'm really saying is that the catastrophic fall in the mark combined by huge government deficits. As I said, you know, we said earlier, a massive government deficit too big will generate inflation, like we said at the beginning. That was the cause. But nowadays, you know, people talk about government deficits causing inflation. I mean, they don't, it's hyperinflation is not something waiting around a corner like a boogeyman to get like a normal democratic country just because they happen to have a deficit. I mean, it's just so far away. To my knowledge, there's no record of a democratic state without facing severe external constraints ever having hyperinflation. So, you know, the idea of, you know, MMT, bring it in, well, you can't bring it in because it explains how the system was anyway, being hyperinflation is rubbish. Because if it was true, since MMT describes us, we'd have hyperinflation all the time. And we don't. So you've got to look at these things in the cases very carefully. You know, I don't profess to be a historian. You know, I'm interested in the Weimar thing. You know, you know, uh, I know Patricia, as you've pointed out, is very young. I think last time you said how young Patricia is. So maybe when she's finished her master's, <laughs> there is a cracking PhD thesis. Let's <laughs> Not that young. I'm our public inflation. There we go. So, um, and there's something else that we're not talking about when it when it comes to Germany and the German hyperinflation, which is the gold standard. Yeah, uh, you know we we have fiat currency now, and the the gold standard is um, mm-hmm. well. How, how would you describe it, Phil? Oh, the gold standard, and and how it plays into the Weimar story. Well, the idea of the gold standard, in a way, is this idea that. You know all these uh, mainstream economists, they love the idea of some sort of self-correcting mechanisms. They, they can't get enough of those. I think that when they wake up in the morning, you know, they little bowl of cereal, a bit of, bit of <laughs> skin milk, and then they dream about a self-correcting mechanism heading towards equilibrium. I mean, this is just their life for a little bit. Now, the old gold standard is great, isn't it? You know, because everyone's money is fixed to gold and in principle exchangeable gold. Everything, all your paper money is fully fully backed. But these guys dream about the gold standard because it restrains profligate governments. So they can only issue as much money as they've got gold back into it. Now, if you run a trade deficit with another country, in principle, they total it up and the deficit has to be paid in gold. Now, all the countries are fixed against gold. And I've probably maybe mentioned before that Bank of England often had all the gold reserves of smaller countries in the vault. So I don't know if India owed, say, China, for example. I don't know whether those two had, they would just put a bit of gold on on the trolley and move it from the vault of India into the one of China. Done. All right. So the beauty of the gold standard was it would be an automatic mechanism because now, India's lost gold, in principle, it's got to reduce the quantity of money in line with that, which, as you know, quantity theory, the price level will go down now, so India will be more competitive, result. Whereas China's got a ton more gold, so it can spend more money, its price level will go up, so it lose competitiveness, so it all bounces out of treat. Except for the fact that that's a bit painful, you know, deflating like that. So... It's kind of like putting your brakes on a bike. It might not slow you immediately. They used to do things to slow the flow of gold, raising the bank rate. So instead of just letting all the gold go, you would put the bank rate up to ease the pain a bit. So, for example, if, if you let all the gold go, and technically you'd have to deflate, if you put the bank rate up, all right, then that might slow it down a bit. So it made the process a bit easier, but you still might have to put on all the credit restrictions. So that was, if you like, the bank rate was a bit of a corruption of the idea of the gold standard. But the quantity of money in principle that states could issue was restricted to their gold stocks. Now, obviously, in war, you have to suspend convertibility into gold if you're a belligerent because you need the gold, don't you, to buy your weapons and stuff from neutral countries. So, you know, it's like Germany. I don't know when 
certainly the UK and France, will have suspended the gold standard fairly early doors. You know, I think in some cases, some countries actually ask people to bring gold to the central bank, you know, like patriotism, a bit like, you know, taking off the railings in World War II, get the metal, you know. And then if you imagine the Germans could use the gold to buy stuff to fight the war from neutral countries, so then they would be issuing fiat money now, provided they didn't issue too much of it, you know, as we said, and your tax levels were okay, then you should should avoid inflation. But inevitably, in war, governments are never going to raise taxes quite to the level required to keep inflation levels. So taxes will go up a bit. And they may sell a lot of bonds, as you know, to sort stuff out. Because the idea is the population's suffering enough already. You know, it'd be better for them to defer the consumption rather than have their future claims taken off them. Yeah, yeah. But voluntarily, ideally. In a way, if you're fighting at the front, Christian, say you're out there, you know, in the trenches, in the mud, I mean, not, not to stay light of it, but you've got an idea, you're told, aren't you, that you're fighting for your nation, whatever that is. And you've got a wife and children at home and the letters come, don't they, and say, you know, we're doing all right. You know, the government's looking after us. We we're very proud of you and things like that. If you get letters continually saying that, well, they've raised the taxes and there's nothing for us to buy, but your kids are starving, you can see that this is going to affect morale. A lot of the men will go, what's the point in me fighting these blows because my kids are starving anyway? I'm, I'm going to go home. And that's why you need to have things like, you know, rationing and you had to look after ordinary people because the men's morale would be so low. Plus the fact, obviously, the women are all working in the factories, so you've got to feed them. Otherwise, you know what I mean? It's part of a, a war effort. So inevitably there'll be some inflation during wartime, you know. But I think after the war, the Germans have the reparations problem um, now, obviously, I'm not an expert in reparation, but essentially, it's quite unusual. You're actually taking stuff from the Germans. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, they're not got much stuff. They can pay reparations, can't they, by actually physically go over and take things off them, like they did in the Ruhr, you know, coal and yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Or you can take their gold, but they haven't got much gold. Or technically, you could take their money off them, Provided that money holds its value. Now, in order to do that in principle, I mean, in theory, if you, I don't know, say you wanted to, you know, I'll just pick a figure, I don't know, say you want to take 20% of German national income. If the German government raised taxes 20%, gave you the money, you could buy the stuff that the German people are not now buying. You know what I mean? Like the MMT thing, you've given more room, haven't you? So you've raised taxes. The stuff they were buying with the money you've taken away, you've now given to the Allies and they can then buy it. So they get the reparations. Now, there's lots of problems with that. Like Keynes mentioned, like, will the stuff that they're not buying, <laughs> will it be the stuff the Allies want? But the bigger question is, if you're already starving, and people haven't got enough money to buy the stuff they need anyway, is it politically acceptable in a country that doesn't believe that it's been let down by its politicians? Can you really get away with doing that? Can you really raise taxes that? I don't know, it's political suicide. I mean, as again, I'm not an expert in German political history, but I know the governments kept falling, they were very unstable. And then once the invasion of the Ruhr came, it's mass speculation you know, when they didn't meet their um, quarters of giving stuff, the, the French and the Belgians invaded the road. Then this, everybody thought, well, Germany's at it. They're all selling German marks. People were borrowing marks to sell, you know, huge speculation on the exchanges. Then the rest is history. So the gold standard kind of works in principle when the, everything it's a fine weather model isn't it you know it's like an umbrella that you, is useful when it never rains you know that it well, as soon as there's a crisis people give it up because it doesn't work you know it's like a bit like monetarism it's a bit of a unique it's a utopian project looks good in theory but it doesn't work in practice and it can never stand a crisis you know it just doesn't work uh it's the people that like it are people who philosophically hate the idea of governments being able to do what they want according to democracy. 
It's a very deep thing. The idea if you've got a gold standard, if you like, politicians are inherently untrustworthy of any type. They're out of the game because the gold standard controls their behaviour. Once it's gone and it's in the hands of politicians, then you're going to be a dickens to pay. If you see what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I always think that people who kind of believe in this, uh, we need to constrain government because you can't trust politicians. Yeah. They don't really mean we need to constrain government. They mean we need to constrain the bits of the government we don't like. Yeah. The bits of government that even up the score for people who aren't doing so well, yeah. basically. But all the other stuff, the militarism, oh, yeah. the police brutality, the enforcing of property rights contracts. Yeah. Now we're actually down with that, you know, and that actually is a big government. <laughs> That's not a small government at all, you know. So I never, I never buy into this night watchman state stuff. It's, it's all an illusion, in a sense, isn't it? Like, like Tony Benn said he never heard any general say he can't bomb the enemy because he's exceeded his budget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And what I think is quite funny, you have seen this on Twitter. It's hilarious. You will get what I call centre left guys. No disrespect to them, all right. And they'll give you a figures, won't they? And they'll say how the Tories always expand the deficit. But Labour are better because they've got everything their own way around it. And the reason the Tories and the right, like Reagan in America, they get things work for them because what they do is they make all these noises about reducing government spending, as you know, and cut welfare, you know, cut this nanny state. Then they spend a ton of cash on weapons, cut taxes on the rich. So they run huge deficits. But they've said all the rhetoric, all goes, they're not really that bothered. All the right wingers are cheering. We've got Star Wars and all that stuff and all these tax cuts for the rich, similar with old um, Trump, all right? Big deficits. And, of course, although they're not the type of deficits we'd like, you know, with more government spending targeted on the poorest groups, it's still a deficit. And it still will increase employment. Like before COVID, you know, Trump ground of jobs, president and all that. Because he's got an accidental deficit. So he makes the right type of noises, but in practice. So these guys on Twitter, they've got it all the wrong way around. That's my fee. I'm moving. It's something like Keir Starmer, you know, I mean, Mr. Dull. You know, what he'll try and do is, oh, we're going to be really sensible with the budget. I mean, so in, end, in many ways, although I'm not saying he's as bad as Boris, Boris likes the project, doesn't he? Like, you know, even if we don't like the projects he likes, he'll spend a lot of money. Yeah. He wants to be popular, doesn't he? And he'll cut taxes. So to me, a Boris government, although it's totally incompetent in pretty much every way you could say, and I'm straying into politics, will will run bigger deficits than a Kia robot starmer economy, won't they? I mean, I think so. So through sheer accident. <laughs> The problem, you know, there'll be loads of sort of crummy retail jobs, yeah. But and this is the problem, and also because he's a Tory, the right wing press will let him get away with it a bit more. So you know, even though these guys, you know, these um, these centre left guys on Twitter are actually right, you know, the Tories do have more of the national debt; they have run bigger deficits. They get away with it because they're all the ones getting the tax cuts. <laughs> So the thing result, it's ironic. I was interested because on the subject of exchange rates and inflation, because I often get from people who criticize MMT that, oh, if we start running continuous deficits, then that's going to devalue our currency. And therefore, things are going to be very expensive to buy from abroad. And therefore, that's going to lead to inflation naturally. Because you spoke about Weimar, but in there you spoke about speculation causing the collapse yeah, yeah. in the in the currency. So if we tackle the speculation, is there anything else that we should be worried about in terms of exchange rates causing inflation? Well, I mean, in a sense, VAM is a very extreme case. In a case like Britain, mm. people's argument, as you say as well, if we try to pursue full employment policies, you know, and do what they, I mean, accepting MMT can't be implemented. But if some, some wise guy came in and said, well, you understand, we're going, to, we're going to run deficits, which are big enough to generate full employment, we're going to bring a job guarantee, we're going to do all the right things. Won't speculators simply all go, whoa, Britain's on the way to the wall, we'll all sell pounds, the value of the pound goes down, import prices skyrocket, rapid inflation. So that's their doomsday scenario. Well, 
first point is you can't tell exactly what's going to happen with the exchange rate. Having said that, they haven't got any evidence for that. It may be, possibly, that if we did run full employment policies, initially, this is my guess, speculators would speculate against the pound. Not like the Weimar. I mean, it would be relatively small. The value of the pound, I don't know, it might drop 10 cent or something, 20 percent, something like that. Now, at that point, there might be a bit of inflation in Britain, but it won't be that high because the pass-through is very small, you know, because most of the costs, the admin and other things, you know, the raw material costs or input, it won't have that much effect, all right? Not that we need to panic about. And I'll come to that, I'll part that, the effect of inflation for a moment. So, but what I think will actually happen is, if we're right, and I think we are, if we're in the full employment economy with job guarantee, we're going to be really productive, because we are. And the speculators are not ideologues. Their job is to make money. Now, what they're going to do is, as soon as they say, well, Britain's doing, they're all going to be buying pounds. And the problem for the British pound in the medium term, if you had a fully employed job guarantee economy, is that an upward racing pound, <laughs> which is going to be, because everyone's going to buy it. Who wouldn't do what they need to do, if you sit on it? Now, that's what I think will happen, all right? Now, okay, yeah, but you don't know. Okay, so let's say the doomsday scenario is true, you know, hit by an asteroid and all these guys are all true, that the speculators all keep on selling, right, well, then you just make it illegal. Because every connection in foreign exchange has to be connected to the central bank. You can't buy things without an export license. You can for example, hedge against currency movements in a deal. That's all legal. You've got the documentation. You can't speculate. Banned. So is it difficult politically? Yes. Practically, no. You know, I would probably send me far and pay me mortgage off. You're only allowed to lose 10000 a day. They can track that. So they can track it. So it's easy. And I would actually add something to this, which I think is interesting. Right? In my opinion, if we had... MMT informed policy, there may be an initial fall in the value of the pound. All right. Then I think it will start going up. But well, that's just my guess. We don't need to stop speculation to prevent the value of the pound going down. I'd stop it anyway. Why? Because it's unethical. Why should some guy like in some bank borrow billions of dollars to sell them to speculate to make some money? It's a non productive. Exercise. Now, if all these right wingers say, oh, you can't stop it, it's too difficult. What are you doing in the 1970s? We didn't have computers then. Of course, we can do it. So, we do it because it's unethical, it's non productive. You can't make money speculating. You ban it, you know, it's not, we're not letting you do it. So, if people are buying and selling currencies without any transaction behind it, they get fined, closed down, whatever you want. So, I'm quite tough on that. Life's tough. It's tough if you're poor. It's tough if you're on universal credit. And it should be tougher for these guys who are making money speculating. Even the final point is this. It's about courage. I think this is quite an important point for us. If we're saying we could have a great world, we could have a fully employed economy with a job guarantee, where we look after our pensioners, we have a good health service, all the things that we all want. Oh, wait a minute, we can't do it. Why? Well, the foreign exchange speculators. Are we really going to say that the threat of a few guys in suits in the city is going to stop us doing that? Bring it on. All right? You know, so no, it's not going to happen anyway, because these guys are not, anyway, as I said, they're not ideologues. We've made them into them. They're not any use. But I think the final point I made is the important one. You look the speculators in the eye as a currency user <laughs> who can control what they do and just say, bring it on, do your worst. And they know. I like the same with the bond dealers, you know. But at the end of the day, I think Bill Mitchell wrote a, a, a blog, didn't he? Who's in charge? We're in charge of bond yields. We're in charge of speculators. They're powerful because we've let them be powerful. They don't have to be. 
And as I said, I would ban them. Now, anything that I'm getting a bit more well, political, forgive me, anything that's a non-productive activity, you know, like the guys running a business, creating something that people want, you know, employing people maybe, looking after his family as a private business, fantastic. Our job is to encourage that through innovation. But you've got guys who are just making money out of money by exploiting other people and only enriching themselves at everybody else's cost. I mean, imagine you're in a tribal society. I think that guy might be booted out, wouldn't he? You know, what are you done? Oh, well, I've really looked after myself. No, you guys are all poor. Hard luck. <laughs> We're the only type of economy where we like these guys, you know. Jeff Bezos is a billionaire. What a great guy. No, he's not. He's got tons of cash. He doesn't do anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. I think there was some woman on uh, Radio 4, and she was saying, billionaires, they're good. You know, and they had a politician some chat that was very evasive, you know. Let's tell it straight. You know, we don't want multi-billionaires. What's the point in them? You know, they might do a bit more work than somebody else. Not that much more work. Just tell it straight, you know. And I get a bit carried away with these sorts of questions. You know, apologies. But, you know, the idea of just sort of bending the knee to the foreign currency speculators, when we control them anyway, <laughs> more or less, it seems to me weak, you know? Mm. Come on, bring it on. I, I would like to propose a theme for the last 15 minutes because it's something that I came across first in a book written by George Monbiot, The Age of Consent. And it interested me because obviously he's not an mmt but he does talk about Keynes's banker proposal you know, since we're on the subject of exchange rates. I don't know, Phil, maybe you can describe what Keynes's proposal was about and in an MMT world, you know, how relevant it is to, to our world today. Keynes's Bangkok. Right, well, you know the money hierarchy that exists in MMT where you've got bank money and central yeah. bank money? The idea of Bangkok is another level above but in other words there's an international clearing union yeah and what happens is that there's another currency above national currencies called bankor so it's like an internal accounting system so what would happen is that if for example you exported something to another country your central bank you would get you know british money <laughs> through the accounting system but your central bank would end up with bank or credit at the International Clearing Union. Now, and if you're tending to import, you will lose bank or, so you'll end up, you could end up running out of all your bank or, in which case you'd have to borrow. Now, the thing is, it's a closed system, so you can't take bank or's out. So it's just like a, an old gyro type system. Now, the beauty of that system is that if a country was running massive surpluses, automatically penalties come in. In other words, they have to start buying things from other countries. Mm. So if you amass a ton of surplus on the bank or you've got to maybe expand your economy to allow your workers to be richer, to buy things from other countries. And in the same way, if you're in a deficit country, if you can't get out of trouble, you are because it's a fixed exchange rate regime, you would be allowed to reduce your exchange rate. So the idea of that system is it, it ties everybody into the system. And the most special thing about that is the idea that both creditors and debtors have to adjust. So in other words, if you're a creditor, country where you've got loads of bank or at the central bank you then have to engineer an encouragement of your economy to import more so in other words you, the crucial thing so there's another level above central banks at the top now that never got through <laughs> so we never had that level so currently what we've got now is we've got like the US dollar as a default reserve currency. Now, you could imagine, couldn't you, when something like White, you know, Harry Dexter White was the US rep, how he and the Americans perhaps wouldn't want that system because, in a way, 
the Americans were likely to be the credit of country. They had something like 80% of the world's reserves. So in a way, they're signing up to having to adjust as creditors. To being penalised. Yeah. yeah. So they went for the IMF, which is a fund based on a fund rather than a bank, like Keynes' Clearing Union, like a gyro bank. Now, the thing is, we could talk about Keynes forever. You know, so many complexities, saying different things at different points. For me, the primary driver for Keynes was, he's an internationalist. That's your number one. So after the war, he wants America involved in the system, preferably with his plan, but if not, with the best plan he can get. So he tried the Keynes plan, like you said, with the bank or credit or debt adjustment, another level, which tries to automatically correct imbalances around the world. Couldn't get it. So then he's got to sign up to the IMF because the beauty of that is, you know, at least it, keeps America in the system, you know what I mean? He doesn't want them to leave. And I think this is the the thing about kids. And same when he only got the loan in 1946, I think it was, you know, where he was talking to those American bankers and he he thought he was going to get a grant and he got a loan and he has to sell the loan. And he's desperate to do that because he wants to keep Britain and America together you know, this sort of Anglo-American banking alliance because he's an internationalist. So to me, at the time, it would have been a much better plan than the IMF type fund. You know, it would have encouraged more balanced trade, you know, people not amassing huge surpluses. Does it have any relevance today? Well, you know, people like Paul Davidson, I guess, has been the strongest advocate of a sort of more updated version of that type of system. It, it did make a bit of a comeback, didn't it, in, in 2008? Yeah, yeah, people talk about it. And I, I, I can see it's got attractions. We speak about preventing large surpluses, but, for example, we always say that in the Eurozone, Germany's large surpluses are bad because they're affecting other nations within the Eurozone. But in a fiat currency world, this is where I get confused because... Wouldn't, you know, a large surplus eventually, you know, balance out your exchange rate and and make you either more or less competitive? Trying to translate the bank or system to a modern situation Mm -hmm. is quite a difficult question. I think at the time in the sort of post-war fixed exchange rate system trying to promote, nowadays it's a slightly different question because... We live in a totally different world of fiat currency. See, one of the problems we have now is that people say that we have unbalanced trade. But like as Warren says, there's no imbalance. I mean, say the Chinese want to sell the Americans a load of cars and take fiat dollars back and spend them on treasury bills. Well, there's no imbalance. The Americans have got the cars. And the Chinese government's got the treasury bills. As long as everyone's happy, it's perfectly fine. The Americans are getting tons of stuff for now, and the Chinese are just getting tea bills. Now, you might argue, well, yeah, but what about the people who've lost their jobs in America because they aren't making cars? Well, that's because the, the, the American government doesn't understand MMT, so it can expand its deficit. So you get full employment and the imported cars. Now, if one day the Chinese decided they want to send, you know, spend their dollars, well, that's different. So, in a way, the only way, in my opinion, that you could get a system like Bancor to work now, you would have to have every central bank in every country kind of working together as a unit because you have to back each other up in a way, don't you? I mean, I'm not an expert in the old... Um, ERM and things, and when Britain was in it, for example, they didn't work with each other, did they? So, you know, it was all that speculation against the pound in 92, you know, Black Wednesday. Well, surely shouldn't, if the German Bundesbank, as was, was acting on our behalf, shouldn't it have started buying pounds with Deutschmark? Just throw that out, just to stabilise it. Why didn't they do that? I mean, I don't know. If we were in it together... Surely they would have done that, wouldn't they? So in other words, if central banks acted, if you like, collectively to stabilise interest rates for everyone, so in other words, when their interest rate's going up, you know, 
start selling their own currency and buying foreign currency to bring it down and vice versa, then it'd be fine. From what I can see, we don't live in that type of world. We live in a world where countries, if you like the neoliberal world, it's a very competitive world. And the Germans, well, it, there, it's a difficult one because obviously you could argue on a social and political level, the Germans well, it, are very it, welcoming. But the Bundesbank is only really concerned with one thing, inflation, and the Bundesbank itself. So there's no way the Bundesbank would be interested in reducing its currency to support others, as was examined in the 1920s. I don't know the politics of it. I haven't studied it. But in answer to your question, I don't think that politically we're in a place to have that type. In principle, every country's central bank was prepared to do what I've said. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head, you know, all the major central banks all agreed, right, we're all going to use a sort of an ICU type thing. We're all going to try and do what we can to make the system work and work in all as a team, maybe. Are we there? No. So in the meantime, floating exchange rates for each country and capital on controls, not because we need them, because they're ethically correct. But the bank or system, to me, is a very interesting system. One thing I've never found with it, it maybe is out there, is examples of what happened on the spreadsheet. You know, like I've never seen a, a systematic treatment of, you know, the various T accounts. It might exist in the literature, but I've not seen, you know, like if you buy this and this. So they all talk about it in words, but it maybe is out there, but I've never seen it. But the best way to think about it, I think, is just putting another level on your pyramid. So if you imagine the the balance sheet of the International Currency Union, on its liabilities, it would have all the bank or accounts of the countries. So if, for example, we ran a balance of payments deficit with the US, the US bank or account at the ICU would go up and else would go down. And on the other side, the assets would be their reserves, maybe gold or whatever they've got as reserves, plus any loans they'd made to, you know, countries that were in it. Now, once your bank all got too big or too low, or your overdraft got too big, then you would have to start spending, if that makes sense. So it's almost like, look, I don't know what the levels are, but you've got to start making some adjustments. And that's a very simplified picture of it, but that's what I understand by the bank or system. I know Paul Davis, I think, writes in International Money in the Real World, I think. He talks about a modern version of it a bit, or well, even that was, was it the 80s. Okay. Or that was something we could dig into in a future episode. We'll bring it into the home straight now, Phil. You're about to do an event for the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies. Yeah, yeah. Those lovely people. And this episode will probably come out after that event, but we will link to the video of it because I'm presuming they'll be yeah. uploading yeah. the video to the GIMS website and to their YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, uh, if not, I will show up at the meeting and just record it <laughs> on my computer. But um, can you give us an overview about what's under discussion at the event, Phil, or is it, 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 are you just going to riff it? I mean, these events, as you know, are quite difficult because there'll be people joining who don't know anything about MMT. Right. Some who know a bit about MMT and some who know quite a lot and want me to apply it and to the post-COVID world, you know, what what insights can MMT bring to the options we've got? So really what I'm going to do is introduce MMT, you know, the, the usual thing, you know, about the, the, the currency user versus issuer thing. And then I will kind of talk a little bit about, you know, taxes, don't fund spend, the usual things we talk about, try and promote a bit of thought. Uh, then I'll talk about debts and deficits. You know, you don't need to worry about your grandchildren, all that sort of stuff. And then I'll go on really at the end to think about post-COVID, what, what that it's the real resources. If we've got the real resources, willingness to use them, we can have a Green New Deal, for example. We can have a good health service, etc. It's about real resources. And in terms of less developed countries, the developing world, if they don't have the real resources, it'd be great if they use MMT. If the real resources aren't there, you know, so if the government's fully using, use, using, if you like, the MMT lens, and they just haven't got it, then we need, as, if you like, the 
the global north or the Western world, we need to organize real resource transfers. You know, that would be technological help, you know, various types of food aid development, all the things that we need to help poorer countries. That involves real risk because it's all real resources, as you know. So that's really what I'm going to be looking at, what MMT is, what insights it brings to making life better post-COVID, and then the third, helping, you know, like the poorer countries. And the other thing I think is very important, which my supervisor is very interested in being the TSSI Marxist, is the way capitalism works is through crisis, the weakest firms disappear. That's what it's like, it's competition. So the state should not be supporting indiscriminately large capitalist business. Some, yeah, yeah, others not. You know. So is this the time for us to be thinking about whether we do want the handing over loads of government money, it's not taxpayers' money, keying in money and giving free gift to, you know, companies that are destroying the environment, airline companies, various sorts of companies. Should we be giving airline companies perhaps over, shall we say, not, not pay the taxes, putting money in tax havens, showing scant regard for the community, who now say, giving me money, I'm in trouble. My question is, no, some we will support. Because we don't just want the status quo, do we? We don't just give everybody back all their money they've lost. And that is an interesting question. I haven't got the answer, but who should, given the government's got the spreadsheet, who should the government be supporting? Yeah, we've seen what's essential and what's not. Because this is this is the big question. Yeah, it wants to support people. You know, the health service, yeah. What about Branson? Should we give him money? So, so, so when when is the event and how Eighth, do people sign Eighth up? 8th of August, Eighth yeah. of August. And is, it, is this a virtual event or are people going to actually go? It's going to be virtual, I think. I'm assuming okay. it is. Yeah. I mean, I just do as I'm told, you know, the girls set it up and I just follow the link. And then they introduce me and I'm a bit like a clockwork speaker, as you know, you wind me up and <laughs> the way I go, you know. And, and just one last thing before we wrap up. So, like we said earlier, uh, it's been a great year for MMT books. Yeah, yeah. Yours is coming out in November. It's called Can Heterodox Economics Make a Difference? Conversations with Key Thinkers. Can you give us a quick overview? Oh, yeah. Well, keep an eye on the clock. Uh, and uh, I'm not two minutes max. I'm looking. Yeah. Basically, what it is, is we all know that we like MMT. My view was in. 2018 and 2019, when I did the interviews, I would try and access economists and policymakers what they think about MMT, what they think about everything, what, what they think about money, government spending, but particularly what they think about MMT. Some of them are mainstreamers, some of them are Austrian central bankers. So I'm asking a range of questions, like you two, not as well as you, I must confess. And these interviews are all in this book. So there's a short introduction and sort of conclusion. What I think is very, very interesting about the book is in two years, how things have changed. Because in 2018, I interviewed a leading mainstream economist, Professor Roger Farmer. Very nice guy, very intelligent guy. I met him, I interviewed him. He'd not really heard of MMT, but to give him his due, yeah. he was interested in it. He asked me about it. A couple of months ago, he ran this thing I was mentioning earlier, this big global Zoom conference about MMT, where Warren spoke, Stephanie spoke, and he did say at the beginning, well, I was interviewed by a grad student two years ago. So it does show that some mainstream economists are prepared to, to engage with it. Now, Roger is, because in my opinion, he's an intelligent guy, he's confident in his, in his position, he's quite a senior major professor. He can talk about these things because he's the man and respect to him for doing that. Whether or not you like your standard issue guys, who aren't as well regarded and as flexible thinking as him, I don't know. But it's just, that, in a way, told me something. So that's what the book, lots of interviews, dip in and out, handy book just to keep around the house when you've got a spare ten. What, what, I wonder what Charles Goodhart thinks about MMT. Or, yeah. you know, what does, uh, I don't know, Tom Pally think about MMT? You can guess... It's in the book. Uh, did uh, Tom help uh, Warren uh, at some point? They don't really get on, I don't think. Uh, Tom, Tom Valley is a nice guy, but when it comes to MMT, he just kind of 
smoke comes out of his ears and it'll hot. He just doesn't <laughs> like it, you know. But I mean, I wanted to talk to him about it because you've got to ask your critics. So the critics are in there. There's one last thing. So uh, I'm just quoting from the um, description on the uh, Edward Elgar site. So it's a book of in-depth interviews with leading economists and policymakers from different schools, including Austrian, monetarist, New Keynesian, post-Keynesian, modern monetary theory, Marxist, Straffian. And I was like, whoa, what's Straffian? I missed that episode of Star Shraffian. Trek. Uh, <laughs> what, can, can that be described? To the layperson. A, a stra- well, well, a straffer. A straffer is a guy who, in many ways, has got his own school, sometimes called Neo Ricardian. He's Italian. Some people it? think they are part of post Keynesianism, all right? Other people think they're kind of rebellious Marxists, and others think they're neither of those. But they are a heterodox school, sort of the bad boys of. The bad boys of Paul's Keynes is my suppose. God, I thought that was us. I'm not in any way an expert on Straffer, <laughs> all right? But he is an Italian economist, somewhere around with Keynes, you know, in Cambridge, you know. Uh, interesting guy. You know, Keynes rescued him from Italy, you know, and he came over and hung around with the gang, you know, in Cambridge and wrote a very famous small book called The Production of Commodities by Commodities. Great. I think it took about 35 years to write it, but it had a massive impact on the heterodox world. So I felt I ought to get a Serafian in there, and uh, I got Gary Monjovi, who is like a big, big name in Serafian economics, and also a very nice guy as well. Great to interview. Enjoy. Sounds good, yeah. Oh, so excited. So excited for this book. It's good. It's, you know, I'm really stoked for you on the academic front and getting this book out. It's uh, really looking forward to it. And so it's been great to talk to you as ever, Phil. Yeah. Uh, look forward to next time yeah. already. It's an absolute pleasure. Pleasure to have yeah, you thank here. You. Glad to have well, you. Well, know, we look forward <laughs> to next time. And uh, thanks again, Phil. And uh, great to talk. All right. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Take care, you too. Cheers. Uh, Take care. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon starting at a dollar a month and get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Editing and post-production was by Damien Caldwell. Thanks for listening.